thanks for coming out today. It's a, a pleasure and an honor to visit here on the Hill and also uh, various faculty members uh, down at, uh, at Berkeley, uh, the university. Uh, as John mentioned, I'm going to talk about electrochemical energy storage technologies and the automotive industry, key drivers and needs. Um, the outline of the talk is shown here. I'm going to start out rather general and talk about some of the issues that we face as a society in terms of energy sustainability. Much of this is probably familiar to you, but it helps set the context for some of the subsequent work. In the second portion of the talk, then, I'm going to go a bit more into what is a major trend in automotive today, that is lithium-ion traction batteries. Uh, you may not know this, but although there's a lot of work in this area, there's actually no high volume lithium ion traction battery out on the road today. It's one of these things that's going to become imminent, imminent probably about post 2010. Uh, so I'll focus on uh, lithium ion batteries, look at some new results with my collaborators at uh, what used to be called Hughes Research Lab, now called uh, HRL Laboratories. That's half owned by Boeing and half owned by General Motors, and we have some battery projects there. And then, secondly, some work I've done with a colleague at University of Kentucky on stress strain distributions in insertion electrode particles. Um, and I'd like to also cover some of the promising develops in, developments in lithium ion batteries and then I'll, uh, I'll draw some summaries. Uh, with regard to the, the high level context, um, this gives a bit of uh, what's going on both in terms of the major driver, obviously world population, and that's on the left ordinate then uh, over here. And uh, you can see that uh, in today's uh, terms, we're hovering between the uh, 5 billion mark and, and plus or minus around that region. And I put a blip in here as far as the right side on the vehicle park. Vehicle park is all the vehicles that are out there, not just those that are sold uh, uh, annually. And the blip is because obviously we've gone through a rather significant financial uh, turmoil in, in the last year or so. And so uh, that, that's the reason for it. Uh, one of the things that's clear actually on this chart is if this trend continues, a automotive business is actually a very good business to be in. It's continually growing in terms of the marketplace. But B, there's a question about sustainability. Um, in terms of GM uh, uh, specifically, obviously right now it's still going through some of the shakeout of this last turmoil. Um, but uh, as of two years ago, we sold more vehicles outside of the uh, United States than within the United States. And that was a, a change in trend for the industry. And so it's the growth in the developing markets that's actually uh, driving this uh, industry in terms of vehicle volume. Um, uh, a plot that you'll see if you plot almost any commodity or any item that's purchased is a monotonic increase with the per capita income. So here we're looking at energy consumption uh, per capita on the ordinate and then the annual GDP per capita income in U.S. dollars, in this case $2,000. And you can see this generally speaking monotonic income. You can see a couple other plots that reflect this as well. And again, it drives back to that notion of sustainability. Uh, these are 2005 data. Uh, this is a rather recent publication by the group out at MIT. Uh, some of you may have uh, seen some of their work in, in uh, recent times. And it's, it's actually quite enlightening. If you look, for example, at this uh, black curve shown here, ranging from 1950 at the start to uh, 2005, you can see the effect of GDP per capita uh, on the uh, EPSISA again, and then that effect on the passenger miles traveled, vehicle miles traveled. <coughs> on the ordinate. And basically, people travel a whole lot more when they have uh, a higher income. And then the asymptote that they're trying to infer is sort of interesting here. It's a little bit hard to tell as plotted. But right around here is if everybody took a uh, jet airplane to travel around, and you can think of that as a limiting process, perhaps that's what they couch it as. Now, the next slide is what really is uh, not obvious and I found intriguing about this. It turns out that no matter where you are as a human being, if you think of the average human beings in that area, we tend to travel in a fairly narrow bandwidth of, a, of duration. We travel about an hour to an hour and a half a day, a day. If you're walking to your place where you're going to do work in a farm or in a village in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, or if you are somebody who lives in the, the Bay Area, we all seem to travel about an hour and a hour and a half a day. And uh, that's rather remarkable when you consider the previous plot and what we've seen previously about vehicle miles traveled. It's almost like this notion of personal transportation one way or another, be it by foot or in a, in a vehicle, or uh, also it relates to uh, uh, commuting in, in buses or other uh, vehicles. Uh, it seems to be rather constant for society, for individuals. Um, now, coming back specifically to automotive on this chart, 
Um, I'm going to highlight that in just a moment. But this is a layout that was put together by uh, folks at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in about 2005 again. And they were looking at all of the energy sources on the left-hand side of this plot. Uh, hydro at the top going down to fossil fuels with oil at the very bottom. And the outputs are on the far right are the uses of the energy. So what you see for automotive that becomes uh, problematic is that the largest component of the fossil fuels, that is petroleum or oil, uh, is utilized uh, for the most part by transportation. And that obviously is something that raises questions in terms of sustainability when we talk about growth in developing markets and, and the projected increase in vehicle park, car park uh, globally in the future. So to summarize uh, this portion, what is, I think, clear to everybody is you have to have three pillars to uh, energy if you're going to have any sort of solution. Secure, clean, and affordable energy is the way I've couched the, the terms that are listed here. And that's true for every nation state, nation state seeking sustainability. And what is key, I think, to understand, although there are potential solutions that we all recognize, more work is going to need to be done. I would classify that as the ultimate solution will come out of advancements in science and technology. And that's why it's an, an important area and we see more effort going to this, this topic. So going to now uh, uh, the automotive industry and in terms of what we're doing today, different energy resources, again, are listed on the left-hand side. And uh, these start out with conventional source of oil, if you will, to fund our vehicle, our, our, our drive our vehicles. And then as you come down to some of the other more unusual sources, and the conversion technologies, and you can argue about this part of the, the plot, but the conversion technologies then are shown in the center, uh, center left, and then as you come across to the right, you can see the energy carriers that result, uh, liquid fuels, electricity, and hydrogen. And it tends to be cleaner as you go down to the bottom. Uh, you might argue that about some of the issues around uh, nuclear, uh, but in terms of on vehicle, what you get is certainly cleaner. Um, and then the uh, battery technologies in particular that I'll be focusing on tend to influence the hybrids, the plug-in hybrids, and the electric vehicles shown here. Um, so what's very clear about this kind of chart is that if you're worried about that energy security, one thing you might do is, just as you would with any investment, you might try to diversify. And so you can see that as you electrify vehicles, you actually diversify the energy streams that are available to you, um, bringing in, for example, hydro or other met methods to get electricity into your vehicle for energy. So that's reflected on this chart, and it's not, it's, it's a GM chart, but it's something that other auto companies tend to use as well. Um, and that is, if you think about uh, what vehicles we have and what's, what we're going to see in the future, the ordinate reflects improved uh, vehicle fuel economy and also reduced emissions, uh, so up is good in that respect. Um, and then the abscissa reflects time, so near term today we're dealing with dominantly internal combustion engine vehicles. We're coming into hybrid electric vehicles. There, we're seeing a lot of them on the road, but nonetheless there are about, for example, in the United States, if we're talking about 12 million units a, a year that are sold, there's about 200,000 hybrid electric vehicles sold annually today. Uh, in, the, in the United States. Uh, and then we're moving up into the third generation, if you will, of uh, extended range electric vehicles that I'm going to talk a bit more about today and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And reflected with time then, as we see these different technologies come on, is the fact that you get this energy diversity. And that goes to the last chart that adds security as well as a, a cleaner uh, utilization of energy. A very large question, and I'm not going to dwell, I have two slides or so on this, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this a, a lot. For me, I, I, I tend to work in the area of automotive as an OEM, so General Motors. Um, we worry about on-vehicle emissions. Now, obviously, the, the total picture is greater than that. You have to do a, a well-to-wheels analysis, if you will, or a life cycle analysis. So a big question for us is where do you get the energy from? And that's highlighted by the box I placed in the lower part of this chart. This was a, a APS, American Physical Society, workshop that I took this uh, uh, content for this slide out of the uh, agenda for the Sunday session. It's listed to the left. And George Crabtree was, Crabtree was the uh, organizer of the session from Argonne National Laboratory. Um, you can see some of the talks that were given there. Um, and I took out of George's talk the notion that at the end of the day, it would seem like sunlight's going to play a major role in terms of trying to get direct photon capture, if you will, or photovoltaic energy sources, because there's just so much energy there. And if you walk around the slide, I won't read them out to you, but you, know, you can basically see things like at the, the, the bottom here, that the annual production, human production of energy is about one hour of sunlight. 
don't seem to, yeah, there we go. Um, and, and some of the other numbers around here. So there's an enormous amount, obviously, of incident solar radiation that potentially can be used. There are troubles and, and, and uh, issues with trying to implement that technology, but it seems to offer, at the end of the day, a great deal of promise for this purpose. So if you look at the bottom, when we talk about things like electric vehicles or extended range electric vehicles that I'll talk about today, uh, there's an arrow that's drawn here. On vehicle to the right of this arrow, you have very clean technologies and high efficiency on the vehicle. The unfortunate thing that I'm coming back to again is that when you look to the left here, where do you get that electricity from? That's the problematic part, and that's what we have to work on as we go forward. Uh, so it's listed here in terms of coal, gas, and nuclear uh, fission. There are other techniques, obviously, to get the energy as well. Um, but you want to do no harm going back to the, the actual source stream as well as on vehicle utilization. Is uh, same sort of argument comes into play when we talk about fuel cell electric vehicles. Again, highly efficient vehicles and the only emission of a hydrogen-fed proton exchange membrane fuel cell, for example, uh, is, is water. And that's a great thing and it does no harm, if you will. Uh, but before that time, you've got to get the hydrogen from somewhere. And as it mentioned here, about 90% of hydrogen today comes from the reforming reaction shown from natural gas. A lot of natural gas in the United States, you might think of it as a bridging strategy. Uh, in, in, in time, we hopefully will get to some more efficient way to generate hydrogen for uh, vehicles if we take that route. Uh, one thing that I think is helpful to just touch on before we get more into some of the technical parts of this talk is the comparison of gasoline versus batteries. Uh, the, the end result is batteries don't store a lot of energy per unit mass or energy per unit volume, but it's not as bad as is often made out, and that's why I put this slide together. So if you look at a battery-based EV, and this is just very simple spreadsheet type calculations, uh, at a battery pack level you can get about 130 watt hours per kilogram, watt hours being your unit of energy uh, per unit mass then kilograms. And pa uh, pack efficiencies over a drive cycle like a federal test procedure drive cycle are about 95%. The power inverter is about 95%. The electric motors that would be used then, you're sending your AC current to typically in today's configurations is about 90%, uh, 95%. It uh, can hover between there. So your overall traction efficiency, if you will, from the battery out is about 80%. And you might say then your effective energy density on the vehicle is about 100 watt hours per kilogram. If you look at gasoline, where you have a great deal of energy, it's very hard to compete with liquid fuels in terms of energy per unit mass or energy per unit volume. So about 12,000 watt hours per kilogram. Well, that's about two orders of magnitude greater than what batteries provide for you today. And it seems like an impossible achievement to try to provide the same functionality on an electrified vehicle that you can get with a gasoline uh, fed vehicle. But the issue there is that in terms of overall energy efficiencies, it's much lower in uh, internal combustion engine systems. Uh, because primarily of the heat engine being quite inefficient. And so the ratio is about 15 to 1. It still points out the challenge in terms of energy density of batteries versus gasoline, but it's a, an order of magnitude reduced almost uh, relative to the direct comparison of the uh, battery itself to the, the fuel. So to come back once more then to General Motors, and, and again, I think it's reflective of what other automotive companies are doing as well. I've listed our announced vehicle product programs on this chart. Um, it actually starts here way back uh, with uh, the EV1, I think it's listed up here. And, um, and then our strongest expression of electric vehicles, uh, the, the Volt, which I'm going to talk more about, but our, uh, our front-wheel drive two-mode hybrids, our rear-wheel drive two-mode hybrids, what we refer to then as our GM hybrids, so these are mid-sized vehicles, high-voltage systems, and then going back originally to our bus system. And again, you can see that come about 2010, for all of our programs, we're moving into lithium-ion at that point in time, and I think you'll see this again in other uh, automotive companies as well. Uh, before I dive deeper into the batteries and the battery technology and get a little more specific on, on some of the technical parts of today's talk, um, it might be helpful to have one slide that says, what are the main challenges for hybrid electric vehicles today? And that's listed here. And it's what you might expect for those of you who have uh, obviously worked a bit in this area. Um, batteries and power electronics and electric machines, electric motors are expensive. And one of the problems you have when you make a hybrid electric vehicle is you add a redundant or semi-redundant powertrain to your system. You already had an internal combustion engine path to a transmission, and now you're adding a battery to uh, power electronics to electric machines. So you're adding that extra equipment onto a vehicle. And the end result is you have to worry about cost, you have to worry about packaging, that is, can you fit all these things in? And you have to worry about the mass of the systems. There is a mass penalty, obviously, associated with energy consumption on a vehicle. Uh, then, secondly, you get into issues that are more engineering related, and that's thermal and electrical integration into the vehicle system. And last, which is quite important, especially when we talk about, say, lithium-ion systems, 
is diagnostics and prognostics. For all of our systems on a vehicle today, you want to know about the state of health. You want to know how well something is doing so that if you need to tell a customer by lighting a telltale or uh, telling somebody in a service environment what's going on, you need to have very robust uh, state estimators running to interrogate your various subsystems on a vehicle. So those have to be developed for lithium-ion systems. It's a bit more of an engineering challenge, but it turns out it always is domain-based. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about state estimators for battery systems, but to interrogate a battery and determine how much more life it has and whether it can fulfill its original mission or not, you have to weave in the electrochemistry that governs the system to control models. You can't separate the two. And so there's a bit of science that still comes into that uh, engineering endeavor. Um, so I'm going to transition now to talk about the strongest expression of, uh, you might almost think of it as a hybrid electric vehicle, but we tend to use the term an extended range EV for the Chevy Volt. The reason for that is uh, it has, we, we call it an electric vehicle and it's, it, it satisfies certain regulations, for example, in California, for the California Air Resources Board is an electric vehicle, because no matter what you do with the vehicle, which is coming out in December of 2010, no matter what you do, uh, for the first 40 miles, after a full charge, it will run as an electric vehicle. You can put your foot all the way to the floor and the heat engine will not come on. Now, in a conventional plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, what happens there is if you pull onto an on-ramp, for example, and you put your foot to the floor for the accelerator pedal, the heat engine will come on in addition to uh, power being delivered through the battery pack to the power electronics electric machine. So you have both, and both systems operative, and you won't have an electric vehicle at that time because you are running your heat engine on a hard axle. So in, in this case, you drive off your 40 miles, and after that point in time, the rest of your range is uh, treated as you would for a charge-sustaining hybrid electric vehicle where you have both your uh, battery working and your internal combustion heat engine working, and the battery is in a charge-sustaining mode at that point in time. Um, the intention here is to overcome the original range anxiety of the EV1 shown on the left, so an electric vehicle, but couple that with the fact that you truly do get, for the majority of your drives, people who buy this vehicle, 40 miles of true zero emission vehicle range. Um, so this chart tries to exemplify or indicate why that's of value, and the demographics point out that 80% of all customers, 78%, commute 40 miles or less daily. Uh, now, obviously, the people who would buy this vehicle would uh, be those that are on the high end of uh, short vehicle ranges, and therefore, they may actually never even go to um, a, a fill-up at a gas station unless they take rare trips that are quite long, in which case the heat engine would offer them uh, the extended range after they drove off their electric range. Um, so I thought what might be helpful, rather than try to describe this thing, is just show a video, and um, hopefully, hopefully this is going to run, actually, here. Okay, battery pack, so it's built so you can build around the battery pack, rear of the vehicle coming on, front of the vehicle coming on. That's the heat power electronics, then the heat engine. Um, you can see things being flushed out, then the, the chassis parts are coming on. Close out body pan, uh, coming again back to the rear wheel, the rear wheel close out. Uh, that's the dash coming on, and seats and what have you. Um, I'm going to show it once more, and then I'll make a couple comments on it. So the main thing is that you, you pretty much have to start these things. I think I'm going to show it once more. You have to start building around the main structure, which is the battery pack by mass. And um, that's, that's basically the, the gist of the video. And then you can see that the, everything else is basically public, or, uh, packaged in conventional volume space of, of a vehicle. And it becomes pretty standard after that. Um, you know, some of the things you want to keep in mind is batteries are a lot like people. You want to give them the same temperature about, you want to treat them the same in terms of crash environment, you want to put them between the frame of the vehicle, you want in any sort of, uh, 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 I'll call it limited event crash, the battery pack doesn't get crushed, um, and, and that then helps a lot in terms of the uh, uh, energy management on the vehicle, and in terms of uh, pr preservation of structures and people. Okay. Uh, so uh, one other thing to keep in mind, we talked about the whole weld of wheels, and the question in this particular case from an E-Rev uh, extended range electric vehicle point of view is what impact would we expect that to, see, uh, to have on the utilities? And the fact of the matter is it would be very little. Now, this is, I, I should point out, this is a bit of a, uh, uh, flip it's too strong a word, but it it's, uh, sweeps some things under the rug. Uh, 10 million vehicles is a lot. In, in, in fact, the, because of the depressed annual vehicle sales volumes right now, um, that's actually nearing about what we're selling these days. 
but uh, the fact is, as I showed on the previous chart, that's not the total vehicle car park. So you'd over time then start replacing the total vehicle car park. The point is that in the near term, you wouldn't see an impact on the utility grid, and that's the intention of, the, of showing this slide. It's less than 1% of the utility grid consumption right now uh, that you'd have if you, if you put uh, 10 million EREVs on the, vehicle, on the road. Um, so what, what's driving lithium ion? And um, uh, what I just want to point out is that I, I think it's clear to folks who have worked in the battery area, but it may not be as clear uh, to everyone. If you look at the turn of the century and before, it was pretty much lead acid was the dominant battery that was rechargeable and the workhorse of, of uh, uh, certainly the traction that is a vehicle use of battery uh, industry. And then what happened in about 1990, the inventions that allowed for this, the science came out earlier. Uh, if you, well, I'll show a slide on that, but um, insertion electrodes came out. And metal, nickel metal hydride batteries are an insertion electrode. There you're inserting hydrogen in the nickel oxyhydroxide, nickel hydroxide electrode, or on the other side of the cell, the uh, uh, metal hydride system. And then after that, shortly after that, lithium ion came out mainstream. Again, an insertion electrode based system. Insertion electrodes typically have very high cycle life. You actually are controlled by solid state diffusion as far as your energy transport goes, or you can be at least, uh, especially for larger particles. And uh, they're very different than the film forming electrodes of lead acid and other uh, similar electrodes of the past. Um, uh, materials research has played a dominant role in bringing these uh, systems uh, into play. You see the uh, graphene planes stacked up to make the uh, typical negative electrodes shown there, and the metal oxide and metal phosphates then are indicated as well for the positive electrodes. So before I go too far, I, I realize the audience is somewhat diverse. So I'm going to dive into some stuff that's more uh, specific to electrochemical research, and, and that's not maybe going to keep everybody. But before I get there, I'm hoping I can keep some folks uh, uh, by saying, here's how a lithium-ion battery works. Um, my son is, is 18, and he made this slide up, and so I, I'm hoping that it works well here as well. It's, it's animation. And it gives schematically an idea as to what happens in a lithium-ion battery. I remember I said insertion electrodes. So what you have is lithium is inserted on one side, and it's pulled out, goes across an electrolyte phase, which is the yellow phase here, and it jumps from sites in the electrolyte phase that are salt sites, if you will, and moves across uh, to give rise to... Uh, uh, ionic communication through the electrolyte phase and the electron goes in the outside circuit and does work for you through an electric machine. And so that's what's happening right here. You can see this is on charge actually and if you went on uh, discharge you just see the exact opposite. The electron would go the other way and the lithium ion would go the other way. Um, and the reaction that we typically use then is shown uh, up at the top in the red box. And so you see that lithium ions combined with an electron uh, on charge and, and that's happening at this electrode over here. And then a vacant site, which these would be vacant sites inside of the uh, uh, host material. And that gives rise to this intercalation species here. The lithium ions have a slight positive charge, and then the surrounding carbon atoms, in this case, have a slight negative charge, and that's indicated by this uh, chi. So now if we take that same plot and we try to expand it to see what's going on, we'll, go, we'll try to dive down into the atomic level, if you will, as to what's, what's happening. It's quite analogous at each electrode. So right here I'm looking at one electrode, and it, the total cell width is on the order of uh, 100 to 200 microns. Each electrode is on the order of 50 to 100 microns, depending on whether it's a high power electrode or a high energy electrode. And the, the electrodes themselves are actually uh, composed of uh, small particles that can be spherical, or they can be platelets or rods or other shapes. And uh, that's uh, shown over here on the right, lower right. And then if you look at one of these particles and expand what happens inside there, as this is a, a negative electrocarbon host. You see these graphene planes. You would see metal oxide planes for conventional positive electrodes or spinel three-dimensional networks. But the lithium can travel inside of the uh, interstices, interstitial sites or inside of the uh, layered regions and insert and therefore be soaked up like a sponge and, and uh, give rise to then to this insertion electrode concept. So um, I'm going to make one comment here. This goes back to some of my own work, and, and others have obviously worked a whole lot in this area and make strong contributions. Um, but one of the things that happened in the uh, early 1990s is many of us were looking at lithium metal uh, negative electrodes instead of uh, intercalation electrodes. And Sony was the first to come out and commercialize an intercalation negative electrode based on carbon. 
Um, actually, and I have this at the bottom of the slide, if you go back into the literature, it was back in the 1800s uh, when people were looking at intercalation of graphites with various species, anions and cations. And so what happened in 1990 or so is people realized, well, you could use these materials to actually make a negative electrode in a lithium-ion battery. What also greatly uh, accelerated the use of uh, uh, lithium-ion batteries in various applications was the development of a stable non-aqueous solvent. It's a product. It doesn't have a proton like in water that can react. And uh, that was done actually at, at, at Berkeley uh, uh, in 1959, was, 1958 was the thesis. Um, I mentioned this to some, perhaps it's helpful to some folks that are wondering about industrial research and how things are done there. Um, a lot of questions have to be answered, I would argue, rather fundamentally, to allow you to decide what path to go on an applied path. So this uh, work was actually done in the early 1990s by myself and my colleague, uh, Brian Cook. And what we did is we took one of these polychrome nitrile fibers shown on the left, and we could easily make a, a microelectrode out of it, just basically make an attachment. It's not hard to do with these six micron uh, diameter fibers. And then we could cycle that individual fiber, and the current response to a cyclic potential source, this potential source is shown in the abscissa here, is shown, and this is for 300 cycles, taken digitally then, and just plotted over one another. And the point is, it's extremely stable. And it's traveling the carbon fiber uh, and lithium uh, lithiation process over the potential of interest for a lithium ion battery. And what it allowed us to say to our management is we're having all kinds of problems with lithium metal negatives. Everybody else was as well. And uh, these are very stable systems, and we can actually make batteries out of them that will work. And so we switched our own program internally, largely based on this kind of work. And so it, it allows you to do scientific work, if you will, that is unambiguous in its interpretation and can drive then robust decision making. So uh, what's happening now in lithium-ion batteries today? Well, the conventional system is the 4-volt system indicated here. So I've, I've, laid, I've listed a layered metal oxide versus a carbon negative and gives about 4 volts. And then more recently, people have looked at trying to improve the stability of these systems, mostly for life. And, and that means using a lower voltage positive and a, or a higher voltage negative, titanates and metal phosphates. And so that narrows, it actually reduces the cell voltage. You can then, you then reduce, unfortunately, the cell energy voltage of energy being proportional to the cell voltage, but you get very high stability, and that's needed for applications. Um, and I'll, I'm going to come back to that point in just a minute. Um, in EREVs versus plug-in hybrids, I mentioned the Chevy Volt is an EREV, an extended range electric vehicle. What you have is a major difference then versus plug-in hybrid electric vehicles as shown here. You just have to have much more power. If you're going to have it so that you have full function electric vehicle and you step on the accelerator pedal, uh, at all times for that first 40 miles. That means your electric machines and your battery pack have to be scaled up to maximum power. So about 100 kilowatts for a very, relatively small vehicle, which the Volt is, relatively speaking. And, and that's the main difference in those systems, a very high power to energy ratio capability relative to, for example, the United States Advanced Battery Consortium requirements and goals for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. And the big challenges then are life and cost for these systems. Um, now, I showed you that people are going into metal phosphates for durability, and I mentioned in the last slide that life is an issue. So one of the things we would like to do is start looking at whether these phosphate-based systems would actually work well in extended range EV systems. And I'm going to transition to that part of the talk now. One of the problems you have, and I mentioned earlier, is state estimation. You have to be able to tell how the system is behaving. And this plot makes clear how easy it is to tell that. Usually what you do then is you read off the voltage, and these are all taken at very low scan rates, all of these voltage traces on the right. So once you read off the voltage, you can follow across. Let's look at a supercapacitor, the red line. If you read off a voltage, and you come over here, and you can see that you're at about, excuse me, about 60% uh, state of charge when I read off a voltage of about uh, uh, 1.6 volts. And, and so that's a thermodynamic lookup table. And it's actually a function of temperature as well, but you can correct for that in your lookup tables and your vehicle controllers. It turns out those two systems that I mentioned that are of interest today for the durability, uh, the titanate system, shown by this light purple curve, and the orange curve, slightly higher voltage metal phosphate system, have a very uh, horizontal uh, voltage profile. And that proves to be problematic. So on this slide, it gives you a really brief tutorial on how you construct a state estimator and why that shallow slope, if you will, is, is, is problematic. First thing you do at any point in time is initialize the state of charge. You have to have it either from a lookup table because you keyed off on an event and you had a state of charge recorded then and you start from there, or you have to infer it by an open circuit voltage at startup. But you initialize your state of charge in a vehicle controller. Then as soon as you start driving or passing any current, you record your current and your voltage. Then you can do two things. You can first do Coulomb counting. That's pretty easy. 
just count the number of coulombs that were passed through on your current sensor, and that's how much charge was transferred from one electrode to the other, and you can get the state of charge of your system, how much energy it can deliver. That's not adaptive, however. That's just counting, and current efficiencies are never 100%, so you can't do that forever. It gets off, and it never adapts back to getting corrected. So the adaptive part is the voltage-based, and that's shown here. What you do is uh, you use a very simple model, typically, lumped parameter model, that retains the salient features of the electrochemistry. You regress parameters adaptively for that voltage-based model, and that gives you the state of the system. And once you've gotten that voltage-based model working, one of the parameters you regress is the open circuit voltage. Well, that then goes back to your lookup table, shown here on the right, and again, once you have that, you can get an SOC. So now you have two SOCs. One is a voltage-based state of charge measurement, one is a uh, Coulomb counting-based state of charge measurement, and then you have a blending algorithm. People in sensing, uh, sensing uh, algorithms, I hope I don't offend anybody here, but when you have something that's ad hoc, you usually give it a fancy name, so it's called sensor fusion. Uh, you, you, you fuse these different uh, things. You might use a weighted average. You might try to have some sort of conceptual way to do it. There are ways that are a little bit better than others, and, and some of the uh, hallmark algorithms are based on the work of Kalman and Kalman filters. But at any rate, uh, you can see from this chart that this voltage-based part, which is the only adaptive part, is problematic when this slope is near zero, the open circuit voltage here versus state of charge. So what I'm going to talk about next is a way to deal with that. That's the motivation for the next part of the talk. So what we did was a chemical modification. This is from some work with uh, uh, HRL colleagues that I mentioned earlier. And we have a, a patent pending on the top of this that I've listed there and a, a publication that's been accepted for a uh, publication actually by Journal Electric Chemical Society that's listed. Um, but in essence, the top portion here is your conventional metal phosphate system. So you have a metal phosphate positive electrode, shown here, lithium ion phosphate. And then you have your graphite. And you always have an excess of your graphite because you don't want to plate lithium on overcharge shown up by this reaction. And actually on over discharge, what can happen is there's a copper current collector associated with your graphite electrode. And if you over discharge, the copper dissolves. That's not a problem actually when it dissolves. The problem is when you go subsequently to charge your battery, that copper plates out, it forms dendrites, and you short your cell, and that can get exciting. So uh, what, what you want to do, what we did then was to say, well, we'll put lithium titanate, which is a very stable material, and it will have a different voltage signature, and we'll put it so it comes in just at the end of discharge, so it's a state of charge marker towards the end of discharge. It allows you to make sure you have enough energy left in there so you don't do something naive like come up to a stoplight in a vehicle, an EREV, and say, do I turn off, or excuse me, when you're running in a charge sustaining mode, uh, as an example, do I turn off my heat engine or not? My air conditioning system is running. It drains at about one kilowatt. If you turn it off and it turns out you're near the end of your state of charge, you can end up falling off, not being able to have enough energy then to start your car afterwards. That's why you need to know uh, the state of the system for efficient vehicle operation. Also for energy consumption calculations that are done real time on vehicles. So uh, I, I should mention one thing. I, when I was uh, putting together, together this talk, I was also trying to keep up in the literature. I happened to notice that John and colleagues uh, uh, here, uh, Paul Albertus and, and uh, Jay Christensen, now, uh, now at Bosch, um, were looking at a similar problem. That was uh, they were looking at multiple uh, constituents in the positive electrode. I'm talking here about the negative electrode, but they had some similar similarities I mentioned here in a quote that you can actually uh, get better handle on the state of charge or state estimation, if you will, of uh, systems by mixing different materials that give diff rise to a different voltage response. Um, so coming back then to the negative electrode that, that I'm talking about, the titanate addition to the graphite negative electrode. Um, one of the things we had to worry about was the electrode stays at one potential. So you have graphite and you have titanate on the same electrode. But both of those species see the same potential. Normally, titanate systems don't go to very negative potentials near that of lithium. You typically operate them at about 1.5 volts positive to lithium. That's one of their strengths is you don't drive down towards lithium potential. But if you're going to utilize all of the capacity of the graphite, now your titanate has to survive at this very negative potential, very reducing environment. So we want to know if it was stable. And the, the end result of this plot with the x-ray data and the cycle life data convinced us that, yes, indeed, it does seem to be very stable at these very negative potentials, the, the titanate itself, independent of the graphite. And uh, the, I'm sort of jumping to some of the conclusions here because I think it's kind of clear enough that I don't probably have to go into some of the uh, uh, more detail for this talk. But this is the, the top plot here is your conventional, it's an A123 cell, actually, so your conventional uh, lithium iron phosphate graphite cell. And you can see, again, this issue that you get an extremely horizontal voltage plateau at a fairly low state of charge. Now, this isn't that low. It's C over 5, so you discharge the battery in this case 
uh, at uh, 12 minutes for total charge and total discharge at this current. So it's, it's fairly high rate, actually, but it's, it's slow enough for this system. It looks like almost thermodynamics in terms of uh, no hysteresis or little hysteresis. Now, if you come down to the second chart here on the bottom, what you see is that as you are discharged in the cell, instead of having to just drop off and then go back, it drops down to the lithium titanate potential hangs around there for a while. So this is the step you have. It's a very clean step. And you can tell for the SOC marker what's going on. And then you reverse the whole process and come up on the top upper curve and, and recharge the battery. So you have a, a clean way to estimate the state of the system, how much energy is in there. And there are other ways to interrogate uh, the effect of the lithium titanate that I'm showing here. Uh, and, and this is just cycle voltammetry. Um, and, and you can see that the bulk of the capacity is carried over here by the graphite. Uh, iron phosphate couple, but a little bit of capacity is carried over here by the lithium titanate system as well. Um, so one way in order to figure out if everything's working as we'd expect, uh, I mentioned that there's one potential and you've got two electrodes, uh, uh, electrode materials. So uh, this is a bit uh, uh, Edisonian as far as how we're doing it, but it allows you to step through and logically see what's going on. We first just put the two electrode materials on the same electrode. Uh, both connected to the current collector, so the same voltage. And uh, sure enough, what you find out is you can just use a, a very simple relationship that would come straight forward, uh, come right out of thermodynamics for the carbon and the lithium titanate. And if you add up then the individual curves, you should get, that's called the model here, but you should get what you get in the experiment, and sure enough, you do. So it's behaving as an ideal system. There's not any unusual interaction between the lithium titanate and the uh, graphite system. You can sum potentials, basically, once you recognize how much charge is going to each uh, constituent. And now this one is different than the last one. Now we mix the powders and made up the electrodes so they're intimately mixed. And indeed, you get the same sort of thing. If you know how much of each powder is there, um, you can go ahead and construct a very simple model. And you can represent uh, the, the results that are in the red with the uh, simple model. Uh, it's, it's too simple to even really call it a model, thermodynamic relation that you'd expect in the uh, uh, blue curve. OK, I want to touch a little bit on some promising developments. And then I'm going to come back to what I talked about earlier on stress strain and degradation. And um, I realize I'm going to be challenged on time. I should be done by noon, I think is the idea, or quarter two for questions. Noon, noon and then 15 minutes of questions, and then people get to go eat at that. OK, good. Um, all right, so this is why, uh, you know, I, I, my thought is I'm very optimistic on where batteries are going to go. They're, they're likely going to have a profound increase eventually in energy density. And it's exemplified by this article. Others have uh, published similar uh, pieces of work. This is from the group out of uh, Bordeaux, CNRS laboratories. And the capacity of most systems is uh, most systems of interest for the negative electrode are plotted here, milliamp hours per gram. So that translates to its proportional to coulombs or, or charge per unit mass of material. And you can see that we're using today uh, uh, lithiated carbon, about 372 million pounds per gram. That's the theoretical value, LIC6. And then as you move to the right, you get much higher capacity materials that we aren't using today. People have tried them, and the problem is, as indicated by this uh, large arrow, is these things tend to decrepitate or break apart because they have very large volume changes. Uh, silicon right now appears to be the, th the, the clear single uh, uh, matrix uh, winner if you only use one material. Now, that looked problematic. Uh, shown here, uh, or it, it can be problematic in terms of the expansion. It's about 400% or so at full lithiation of the, the fully lithiated uh, silicon alloy. However, if you're not greedy, so to speak, and you don't use all that and you combine it with uh, carbon particles, it turns out you can get very high robust cycling, very high capacity robust cycling. That's shown here, about 1,500 million hours per gram. Remember, that's uh, as compared to today's uh, in a conventional lithiated carbon electrode, 300 milliamp hours per gram usable today. So there's going to be a lot of progress there. The way people are doing this, as is mentioned here, is by going to nanoparticles. And you can think about it because uh, it makes sense when you think about it. Solids are a solid because they like themselves. Otherwise, they, would, they just float apart. They wouldn't be a solid. And what happens when you go to these nanoparticles, the adherence of atoms to themselves at the surface tends to become dominant because you actually get, when, when you get below about 10 nanometers or so, you've got more atoms associated with the surface than you do in the bulk. And so the materials tend to hold together. And so what is characteristic of making high capacity electrodes like this work is going to these nanostructures where the surface tension plays a dominant role in holding the structure together and you can tolerate the expansion and contraction. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so this is some work now coming out of the Argonne National Laboratory Group um, through the uh, work with the Department of Energy and, and linked to the BAP program here. 
Um, but uh, it, what's of interest is that today's positive electrode materials that I've, I've talked about, metal oxides and uh, tight, uh, uh, spinel structures, are typically about, from a practical point of view, 150 milliamp hours per gram. The materials that the Argonne Group has come out with and that are being looked at by various entities uh, uh, around the world now, uh, Envia, uh, Envia actually out here in Hayward, California is looking at it as well, are uh, getting much higher than that, about 200 to 250 milliamp hours per gram. And it's an interesting tailored structure that has an inert phase, Li2MnO3, that is of a rock salt structure and is contiguous, in fact you can't see the difference in, under a TEM, with the associated active phase, which is a layered metal oxide, and it gives very robust, it appears to give robust cycling performance, and it appears to be something that will be uh, quite important for us in the future. Um, another uh, new area that I think could be quite important is uh, on the positive electrodes, a lot of work has gone on in the metal phosphates. Another linkage that is extremely stable and very low cost are, are silicates, and so people are starting to look at metal silicates that are already up to fairly good cycle life at 100 million hours per gram. These should be extremely low cost materials. Uh, metal phosphates are great, except they do have a fair amount of cost structure associated with them. The metal silicates might be quite promising for driving down that cost structure. So um, I, I want to speak a little bit about life and get into some of the durability issues. Um, there are two problems that give rise to life issues in lithium ion batteries. One is chemical degradation and one is mechanical degradation. And I'm going to talk first a little bit about the, mechan the, the, the chemical degradation. It turns out that affects counter life. If you just let a cell sit there, it will chemically degrade, especially if you heat it up. If you cycle it, this expansion and contraction gives rise to cycle life problems. The two working together will un unfortunately give rise to, to combined problems. So what I'm talking about is the wear out mechanisms to the far right of what's conventionally called the bathtub curve. Uh, you have infant mortality at first for failures, then you have a long time in service. In automotive, we typically talk about 10 to 15 years. We have a 10-year warranty, for example, on the battery pack and the volt that's coming out. And then you have wear out. So uh, in, in the wear out area, first we're going to talk about the chemical degradation. What the reason a lithium ion battery works is the solid electrolyte interface. Now, there are other things that make it work too, but without the solid electrolyte interface, it wouldn't work. So I want to talk a little bit about that. This is some very high surface area carbon and it's, it's nice to use for this study because it, 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 it accentuates the effect of the first cycle inefficiency. What happens on the very first cycle, shown in this first panel here, is when you scan the potential negative to reduce an environment, you, you break down by reduction your solvent. You have solvent reduction. You see gas coming off, in this case propylene gas because it's a propylene carbonate solvent. And then eventually you get over to the lithium reaction here. And then afterwards, and it's just amazing how this works, it doesn't, you don't see any evidence of it anymore after that. Cycles two, three, and four are here, and they're very reproducible after that first cycle where you've conditioned the surface and no more solvent reduction from an appearance point of view is happening. Well, there, there are various, uh, mostly FTIR, but various uh, methods by which you can interrogate what's on the surface. And, and the uh, uh, dominant species are talked about here, and uh, there's a... Uh, uh, pretty good agreement that actually this is the, the uh, dominant uh, species that's the organic layer. And this is a function of state of charge because if you look at this reduction reaction, you can combine these and look at that as your state of charge. More lithium in your system refers to a higher state of charge than this negative electrode. Um, so you're breaking the bonds of the propylene carbonate molecule here, and the same thing happens with ethylene carbonate that are in uh, conventional batteries today. It turns out there's a layered structure to this SEI. The inner layer appears to be a very compact lithium carbonate region. That's what's shown here when you first start making the layer. And then the outer layer is this more gelatinous, amorphous uh, uh, lithium addicts layer that was shown on the previous slide. And this is some work by uh, uh, TEM uh, that looks at that uh, initial lithium carbonate. And now what you can do after you've grown the thicker layer is you can use AFM in the tapping mode and actually scrape off a little bit of the uh, layer and, and get the total thickness. And that's this organic species that you see by FTIR. And so it's about 20 nanometers uh, in thickness at this point in time when you have this organic layer on top. These are protective layers. Now, I should mention before I go on that at the positive electrode, similar phenomena goes on. It's not as well studied. It is important. It's just something that people haven't gotten around to. But if you go back to some of the early literature, what you can see is that these cyclic carbonates, ethylene carbonate, propylene carbonate, they tend to be reduced on highly catalytic materials, platinum, for example, and nickel oxides as well. But platinum, it'll be reduced at about 2.1 volts versus lithium. We need those systems to operate up around 4 volts versus lithium. And the reason that they operate there is there's a kinetic limitation at the interface because these very reversible materials will actually cause the reaction to occur at a lower voltage. 
Um, so the point I want to make that's not obvious to folks is that if you just went by the thermodynamics, that is that solvent reduction reaction on first cycle, it can happen. It gets poisoned by subsequent SEI formation. And same thing with that positive electrode, the other electrode, you can get solvent oxidation. It can happen. It just surface phenomena stops it from happening. But if you subtract those two voltages, uh, the 2.1 minus the 0.8, you get a 1.3 volt battery versus the 4 volt battery we typically operate with, 3.5 to 4 volt battery. So that underscores the importance of the solid electrolyte interface. The second point is, I mentioned these are the same plots I had in the previous slides. Uh, it looks like there's no solvent reduction going on out here uh, uh, after this first cycle. The reality is that there is, and it's consuming lithium the whole time. Each solvent reduction reaction, is, as is shown here, consumes lithium. If you think of the first cycle, what's your capacity? All of your lithium starts out in the positive electrode. It goes over as, as made. And then when you put the cell together, it's shoved over to the negative electrode. Sometimes they call these rocking chair batteries. And then you shove the lithium back over to the positive electrode. If you lose lithium, as is shown by this degradation reaction, you lose capacity. You can think of that initial lithium put in the positive electrode, you're losing it. You won't have as much fuel to go back and forth. Eventually you have none, you won't have any cell voltage, you'll, you'll lose your energy. So what this shows is that as you, it's like compound interest, if you will, as you start losing lithium to end cycles, you can drive a formula and show that for like a volt program, our, our, our program's come out in December 2010, you need 5,000 cycles. And what does that mean in terms of current efficiency? What it means is that if your current efficiency isn't above 0.99994, four nines, you won't make your 5,000 cycles. You will lose 25% of your cell capacity and you'll have failure, early failure. And in our case, it means warranty. And that affects job security and other issues for me. So, <laughs> so the, the issue is you have to understand that actually you are getting solvent reduction out here. You just don't see it, it's so low. The current efficiency for your dominant reaction is so high. Um, the, the next item is the, the uh, uh, expansion and contraction, and I'll try to do that in the, the last 10 minutes here. Uh, but this is where you combine now this chemical degradation with expansion and contraction. This, again, my son made this chart up, um, but it, it gives this 10% expansion when you put lithium in and, and contraction in, in sort of a, a graphic form. You can see this in graphite. This is graphite flake. You can see it by Raman uh, that you get cracking. You can see it by uh, peak broadening uh, x-ray diffraction. You can see then the crystallite sizes uh, tend to decrease, decrease with cycling. And so you do get, there is strong evidence for cracking of uh, graphitic electrodes. This is uh, from uh, uh, the group at Toyota where they're looking at the positive electrode. Toyota uses LNCA in some of their uh, experimental test fleets that are actually operating in, in Japan today. And as you put lithium in, as is shown by this lower plot, uh, it's a little bit convoluted the way it, it, it's plotted here, but basically putting lithium in goes down here, uh, or I'm sorry, taking lithium out, so you get a 4% contraction and then uh, expansion as you put lithium in. And, and, and that correlates with what you see in terms of this cracking phenomena that goes on in the uh, LNCA electrode that is shown, uh, lithium nickel cobalt aluminate electrode. So you see it on both the positive and negative electrode. And one analogy that I think is helpful is to think about what we see and we all kind of are familiar with, with mud flats or, or sand. When the rain comes out and it hits the ground in, over a, a, a mud surface, the surface expands. That's just like the lithium being shoved into an electrode. You're shoving the solute in and the host matrix and the solute that's combined with it expand and you don't see any cracks. And then as you take the lithium out on discharge, it's just like water evaporating when the sun comes out and you get the cracking. So it's on discharge events after a fully charged system that you tend to get a lot of surface tension that pulls apart the surface and gives rise to cracking. And that's why I put the, uh, the picture of the mud flats in there. We see it on iron phosphate. I won't go through the chart, but the left-hand figures show that as you cycle things, you get cracking in iron phosphate systems. And they expand and contract again about 7%, as is shown by this article. Um, this is, a, 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 turns out, another piece of work by, by John uh, and, and uh, uh, colleague Christensen. And they were looking at uh, some early work in this expansion and contraction area. And what I wanted to come back to is this theme that I mentioned before. If you're going to go to high capacity electrodes, getting small is going to be important. So the different stress components you have to consider, the radial and tangential stresses are shown here. And this potential for fracture is maximized at the surface when you have a full charge, equilibrated full charge, and then go to a very strong discharge event and get that, that tension over the circumferential forces at the surface. And what you find if you look, for example, at the radial stress, same thing with the tangential stress, is that as you go to very, very small particles, surface forces can actually draw that that uh, the, the stress distributions to more compressive stress because the material likes itself, if you will, by the surface energy. Um, 
So uh, I won't go through the theory in depth other than to say you can work out some very simple classical equations and do one perturbation on the system, that is put in surface energy and surface modulus and show that indeed as you get smaller with reasonable parameter values, as you get smaller about in the range of below about 20 nanometers, these surface tension effects start to become very important and try to hold the, uh, and, and tem tend to hold the particles together. Um, and to perhaps underscore this, this is a bit of uh, empirical, uh, non-scientific uh, uh, support. There was a uh, multi-day symposium at the recent Electrochemical Society meeting where it was just on nanostructured uh, materials for energy storage and conversion. The basic notion that you saw time and time again there was that people were getting higher cycle life when they use very small electrode geometries. Um, so the total picture then for degradation is what I'm trying to tie together now the chemical and the mechanical degradation in these batteries, which is what, again, drives us towards things like warranty and, and understanding life of these uh, systems, is expansion and contraction giving cr rise to cracks at the surface. Passivation of those cracks, any new material on the negative electrode has to be passivated, forms SEI, otherwise you don't get a working battery. So it's passivated. That's different passivation reactions are shown here. Uh, and then, in those, those passivation reactions, you have loss of lithium. That's part of the passivation reaction. That's loss of capacity. You can also add in then the ohmic drop that comes at the surface, the irreversible drop from that surface layer that's covering the electrode, the active sites. And you can even get to more uh, profound problems of isolation of active materials, as shown on the, the lower left. So one thing I'd just say in terms of the life issues, uh, calendar life and cycle life, calendar life would favor going to very large particles. That minimizes the surface area for this chemical degradation. However, as I just talked about, if you don't have nanoparticles or very, very small particles, you can be hurt on expansion and contraction cycle life. So cycle life, I would argue, tends to favor very small particles. And so philosophically, you might say life is a balancing act between the two. Um, and you obviously want to reduce both of those. Um, I'm going to uh, draw the summary here because I think otherwise I'm going to run out of time. Um, and mention to you that, you know, recap what we talked about today. So early on, uh, some issues on uh, energy sustainability and some of the problems that we face as a society and, and some of the potential solutions that will likely come out of energy diversity, at least as a bridging strategy, but the importance still of identifying where our initial uh, material is going to come from for uh, purposes of, of energy consumption. Uh, then we looked a bit at electrochemical energy storage technologies focused on lithium-ion batteries and extended range electric vehicle applications. Um, I want to thank again my uh, colleagues from HRL Laboratories and uh, Y.T. Chang that I've been working with at University of Kentucky. Um, and last, we talked a little bit about some of the promising developments for next generation lithium-ion batteries. So I'd be happy to answer any questions now. Thank you. Well, you know, in a sense, they are. I mean, the people who worked, like myself, on the EV1 are the same people doing the Volt. Um, so you might be asking, why don't they make a pure electric vehicle without an internal combustion engine? And it, it, I'm not a marketing person. The general thought was this range anxiety was too difficult to overcome for a market, especially in cold temperatures. You might do it in San Diego or, you know, other places, but if you're going to sell throughout the nation, that might be problematic. So the notion here is let's try to do an electric vehicle. 40 miles will satisfy my drives, most people's drives. Um, if they want it to be an electric vehicle, they're going to get one. If they want to also just take off at some point for, uh, you know, uh, longer trips, they'll get that as well. So hopefully we'll satisfy uh, more people. So there's a lot of discussion about usage of uh, used badly. Recently, Nissan established a joint venture with Mitsubishi to do some business out of it. But it's not good for automotive anymore, but can be used for this dish right. and other uses. So given the technology available today, can you comment on like how many usage would be appropriate for a car and what would be the Yeah, so it's, a, it's a really big question. Dual use. We want to see that too. We've we've worked tried to work uh, towards that in the past with uh, the OEMs with EPRI. Uh, or other entities that uh, might use the batteries. Uh, the idea is that you, you say you have a Chevy Volt. These battery packs are very expensive. Uh, you lose 25% of your capacity at the end of life. Well, the battery pack still has 75% of its capacity. For many, that's sufficient for application. So sell it then secondly at a much reduced price, but buy down the initial cost of the battery by having this dual use. One of the issues there that is of primary concern right now 
is that from the OEM perspective, I'm going to sound like I'm whining here, but uh, part of our issue is we can't get good requirements from utilities or other folks to say, okay, here's what I have to have. Because then we could say, okay, uh, at this point in time, swap out the battery for the customer, put in a new battery, sell it to the utility because it meets their requirements still because our state estimator is, ca is characterizing how the state of the battery. Um, so my sense is this is a, a, a short-term issue. In the long run, I think we will get dual use. It makes sense. It, uh, if it's going to work here, it's still going to have some, some life afterwards. So it's, it will be important coming down the road. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll present you with this poster to remember us by. Ah. Let's thank, thank you, you again.